Benefactor underwriting for this broadcast has been provided by a grant from Republic Bank, The Power of Red is Back. Major underwriting support for this broadcast has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Customers Bank, Collins Building Services, Marks Panic. Additional underwriting support has been provided by grants from Amtrust Title, Bank of America, Capital One Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC, Handler Real Estate Organization, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Kestamitidis Red Apple Group, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Ocean First Bank, RPW Group, TD Bank, The One Stop Property Group, and these friends. Oh, Crystal Apple, are you shiny? Are you bright? What's really going to happen in the Apple in 2022? I have no idea of the answers. That's why I bring the experts and the specialists on to talk about development taking place in the city. We have a new mayor. We have a new governor. We have other administrations, city council, controller, and we still have enactments of 421A affordable development. But I'm not the, the person to answer the questions. So today, with the help of Brian Kelly, we've assembled a group of developers who are building in all five boroughs of the city of New York. My guests include Andy Cohn, who is the managing director of BRP Development Partners, Frank Dubinsky, who is the chief operating officer of Monodnik Development, and last but not least, the individual responsible for bringing Mr. Dubinsky and Mr. Cohn, Brian Kelly, who is the president of the Gotham Organization. So Mr. Kelly, since you're the guy who knows everybody and sees all the developments, what's going to take place in 2022? You know, what's going to happen with the tax credits? Where, where do you see the market? Unfortunately, I think there's uncertainty with the expiration of Affordable New York in front of us. But on the bright side, government is very much committed to public-private partnerships to produce affordable and mixed income housing. And hopefully through compromise, a new enactment of Affordable New York as a newer and better program will be put in place uh, by June of the expiration to ensure the flurry of investment that has hit New York with private capital can be put to play. The benefit of a slow real estate development market over the last 24 months is there's an extreme amount of pent up capital to be deployed. So it would be a, a shame to see a, a failure of a reenactment of a new and better program because there's a tremendous amount of private capital to leverage and deploy to create integrative mixed income communities where a tremendous amount of affordable housing, Michael, can get created by leveraging private capital and not being solely dependent on government intervention through program term sheets and affordable housing subsidy. You know, um, one of my friends who's been on my show numerous times, a developer of market rate and affordable housing says he, he won't go into a new development until they have a clarification of what's happening. Uh, how do, Frank and Andy, how do you see the world? Uh, you're still going into new developments. You're planning new, new construction. I think the three of us probably take the position that the more complicated the deal, the better. If you believe in your ability to structure these projects, these complex projects, and work with whoever the new commissioners are, deputy mayors, um, government staff at the state level, uh, you have to pursue your projects, especially if they're mixed income projects. Um, as Brian said, government partnership is, is an important thing to all of us. And uh, the, it's, been, it's been good to us. And so we believe that 
our projects that are in the pipeline are going to get financed and you have to be ready to go when the government says we're ready to go. And to Brian's point, you know, about capital being available, I think we're at a time and a place where there's a tremendous amount of private capital and equity available for workforce and affordable projects. Um, and we've been able, we've been successful in pivoting uh, in, in many cases away from sort of a tr traditional agency financing and using the Affordable New York program to build in workforce communities like Jamaica Queens, either utilizing the Opportunity Zone program or uh, Brownfield's uh, cleanup program in connection or conjunction with private equity and private debt to make deals work that otherwise, you know, five, 10 years ago, we would have had to do, you know, 100% agency financed. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there, but, you know, the deals we have been able to do have, have worked well within sort of the affordable New York, uh, uh, the current program. So we'll see what happens in the new program and how that, how that impacts our ability to, to operate in these neighborhoods. I have, I have a big question. You know, there, there's limited amount of land available in the city of New York. How do you find a new location to build? It's not 20 years ago where you had lots of property in the Bronx. You had the inclusionary over there. You had other markets. How do you find land today? It's difficult. I mean, I think you have to be creative. Um, you know, I think all of us have been in business long enough where we have, you know, we have uh, site control over properties that, you know, could probably take us through the next year, couple of years in terms of development. But overall, you have to think creatively. We've done a lot of JV deals with landowners who've just been sitting on land forever, either parking lot owners or churches, um, where we've structured some sort of uh, deal where they stay in the deal. We, you know, we provide a church condominium unit and the, and the church is in the ground floor of the cellar and, and we build a building above. Um, we've done deals where, you know, the uh, seller you know, holds on to some paper and, and we, we develop under a joint venture. So I think you have to start thinking creatively uh, in those terms because land prices are just so high in a lot of these neighborhoods, especially neighborhoods that have been rezoned. It's very difficult to make those deals work right now. And with the uncertainty, could that couple with the uncertainty of 421A or affordable New York, it's, it's, a, it's, a, tough, it's a tough market. Let's talk about the Gowanus. I believe that, uh, uh, Frank, you, you have a major project plan for the Gowanus, right? Yes, I mean, our office has been in Gowanus for uh, over 40 years. So um, we've been tracking the Gowanus rezoning. We actually have two projects in the Gowanus and the rezoning has passed, um, but uh, it's not out of the woods yet. Um, it's a very complex rezoning that has to do with adding thousands of market rate and affordable apartments to a uh, industrial neighborhood in between Park Slope and Carroll Gardens. This is formerly industrial land that's being cleaned up as part of this rezoning. Um, and your ability to upzone the neighborhood, which is a very wealthy neighborhood, um, to create more affordable and market rate housing. That's how you create new land, um, is to clean it up with the help of the state, uh, the city, the federal government, and upzone it. Um, so you get these affordable housing units, thousands of them at no cost to the city. Brian, let's talk about uh, your, your, your project near uh, the Lincoln Tunnel. So Covenant House is an example of how to create housing through uh, not-for-profit or my other term, public-private partnership. So for five years, the Gotham organization worked hand-in-hand -hand with Covenant House, who assembled three buildings dating back to the 70s and 80s uh, between 40th and 41st Street in Hell's Kitchen. And ultimately, through our prowess, our 108-year history, uh, we gained their confidence to be able to design for them in a phased fashion, uh, a, a demolition of a couple of the buildings with a consolidation temporarily. And we've leveraged the value of their land to get them a construction loan to build a brand new 80,000 square foot purpose-built facility for Covenant House, which created shelter homes, a federally qualified health clinic, uh, gymnasium space, class work, classrooms, workforce development center. And ultimately, the great outcome of it is that the second phase is the balance of the land with all the frontage on 10th Avenue, uh, just at the north end of Hudson Yards. And when we closed on the land this past November, we essentially paid off the construction loan Covenant House took out to build their new facility. So they own their headquarters debt-free, and we are now going vertical uh, on a 47-story tower with 453 homes, 
uh, which 30% of them will be permanently affordable. And, and that goes back to the point of there may be hundreds of millions of dollars in the city budget annually to create deep skew affordable housing. And that's what Gotham, as well as my counterparts on this call, do for a living. But the greatest opportunity in the city is to leverage the billions of dollars of private equity to create market rate homes with, which cross subsidize with the abatement program, the creation of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of units annually of deep, deep skew affordable housing in high income districts, which at the end of the day creates an inclusionary environment as well. What, what do you foresee with the, the Affordable Act coming up in 2022 for affordable New York? Is it gonna be a 50% requirement for affordable apartments? Is it gonna be a lower, lower threshold, okay? As opposed to somebody earning as much as 130,000 for a family of four, you know? Where do we see that? Because we have, you know, a political environment that people believe that developers are evil and you're really bad people. But where do you see what's going on, Andy or Frank? There are government programs that subsidize low and very low income housing um, through HPD and HTC and through the state. The market rate uh, takes care of sort of the, you know, upper income and luxury. And then sort of the middle class, the workforce gets left out of this, right? And those are the people that we're losing. They're going, to, they're going to Pennsylvania, they're going to Atlanta, they're moving down South. And I would argue that, you know, while, this, while the, the past administration did a lot of work early on, on, you know, developing middle income housing, um, you know, in recent years, it's been more focused on low and very low income housing. We've lost a lot of this workforce and it's been exacerbated through the pandemic. And that's sort of the engine that you need uh, in the city. And when you, you know, when we're, when we're taking away that 130 tier, that 80 to 130 tier, um, that's sort of naturally occurring through the Affordable New York program, we're losing those people because they don't have very many options in New York City. And so I think, you know, while it sounds great to say we want to do more and deeper affordability in certain markets that, that first of all, the program just won't work because you need sort of those middle income uh, units to make the deals pencil. But in other cases, you know, you're losing the people, the very people you want to stay. And we're, we're exacerbating the issue of this tale of two cities where we have very rich people and, and, and you know, and sort of folks on the low income scale. So it's, it's tough. Brian, let's talk about Long Island City. I know that the lottery is still open, I believe, for the affordable apartments. Yeah, the application process ends on the 17th. And I think that development is a model of the kind of development Andy was referring to, where it, there was city land conveyed to a public-private partnership and created an opportunity for us to mix incomes in a unique way. So of 1,132 homes, we have a combination of market rate, very low, low, middle income, moderate, and on the waterfront, with waterfront, which was rezoned uh, many years ago with the idea of creating one of the largest moderate middle income communities in this country. In many of my shows, we, we, we talk about the, um, the stepchild borough, okay? And the stepchild borough, I believe one of you guys, it does work in Staten Island. Now, Staten Island has possibilities. You know, it's a good environment. You know, it's a nice place to raise a family. Why is there limited development in Staten Island while there's land in Staten Island? Frank. That is a, that is a complex question. I don't know that I know the full answer to that question, um, but maybe I can talk to it through uh, the lens of our project. We were just selected as the winner of an RFP, a city RFP to build uh, over 300 affordable apartments on the Staten Island waterfront and uh, facing Manhattan, incredible views. I think you know our project is going to be completely affordable. Um, there will be future projects on the Staten Island waterfront um, as the city builds out the beautiful new park. Um, and I think those projects will be more middle income and perhaps market rate as people move into this area. I think uh, there, are, there aren't that many places in Staten Island to build of scale. Um, and the waterfront is one of them um, and is in demand, easy to get to Manhattan, um, and Brooklyn, if you, you know, time yourself correctly on the Verrazano Bridge. Um, or but, the ferry. Yes, or the ferry, absolutely. Um, the ferry is very easy. Um, but I, I think this is the beginning of a, um, more development in Staten Island, especially on the waterfront, um, as people um, look to live um, in places that are, that are less expensive and, and 
Staten Island has a lot of great things going for it. Um, and uh, so for, for my audience, what, what's what's the income levels and what are the rents going to be in this development? So it's it's all low income housing. Um, and and to Brian's point earlier, this was dictated by the city. Um, the city released an RFP for a site on the waterfront, and uh, it's going to be a 360 apartments. 15% uh, of the units will be formerly homeless, um, as, as decreed by the city. And the other units will be at 30, 40, uh, 50, and 60% of AMI. Um, and uh, the project will have uh, a number of community facilities, um, Meals on Wheels, uh, another, a number of other local Staten Island groups. Um, and, and this is not something you brought up, but one of the complexities that we're dealing with on a lot of projects, I know Brian is as well, is building in a flood zone. Um, this project needs to be set up uh, two feet above the current flood level, um, which is four feet above grade. So we need to be six feet above grade. Um, that's, you know, building in areas like that on the Guanis in Hunters Point South and Queens, uh, those are the complexities you deal with um, to build affordable housing. And this is city on land, so we have a great partner uh, to do it. You know, Andy, one area that Gotham has been involved with for more than a quarter of a century is Harlem. And you're, you're developing in Harlem. Let's talk about some of the things that you're doing in Harlem. We've developed in Harlem really since our inception. Um, we've done, in recent years, we've done two deals in Harlem. Both have been mixed income condominium projects. Um, we have one project called the Orem, which is on 100, 131st and 132nd. Uh, about 100, uh, 100 units of, uh, of mixed income um, uh, condominium, uh, home ownership. And then we have another project on 138th uh, called the Rennie, uh, which we did in partnership with Abbasidian and Baptist Church. Uh, we bought an underutilized piece of land from them. We built uh, sort of a, an offshoot youth chapel um, adjacent to the condominium building. And then we built 134 uh, condominium units, mixed income units. Both of those deals got into the old 421A program when they made uh, the tax exemption available for home ownership. Um, you know, condominium uh, development is really all about timing. Uh, residential uh, 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 rental development is, is, you know, in New York City, you know, as long as you hold on to it, I think it'll do well over time. Condominium is all about when you bring the condos to market. Uh, so we brought the Orem to market in a very hot environment. We brought the Rennie to market, which is, uh, you know, just six blocks north. Um, very similar in terms of scale and size, uh, you know, in more of a down market, although it's picked up significantly, you know, as we're coming out of COVID. For the, the, the market rate units, somewhere between, you know, 1,000 to 1,100 bucks a foot. Um, and we're targeting, you know, professionals uh, who, who, who either, you know, live in Harlem um, or are looking for, uh, you know, an opportunity to buy, to buy a unit that they can, they can afford. And they're priced out of, you know, most of Manhattan at those price levels. Now, are there and affordable components also, even lower? There are, affordable. yeah. There are, there are affordable components that are priced at um, uh, sort of 120% of AMI range. You have to go through, uh, you know, a process application process, which takes, you know, a little bit longer than just going out and buying a unit. Uh, but those are priced, uh, you know, significantly below market. Um, you know, with, with regard to other areas in the city that have opportunities, and I believe all of you have been involved with it, is East New York. There is land over there in East New York. There's a little difficulty with transportation. Safety is another problem just in general in New York City. So let's try to address uh, East New York. Brian, you have a small project with my friend, the Reverend. Yeah, the, the, the opportunity there was to create what he and I call, along with Vishan Chakrabarty, our master planner and, and design architect, the infrastructure of opportunity. And, and that's that we've got one of the greatest uh, evangelical in, institutions in this country, a Christian cultural center, um, assembled property that's now 10 and a half acres, um, just surrounded by Pennsylvania Avenue and Flatlands. And it wasn't part of the initial East New York rezoning. And Pastor ultimately said from his many years of experience working with the community, there are things that I'd like to leave behind to the community as part of a dynasty 
um, of doing great things. And that's the arts and culture and education and diverse income-based housing. And so we put together a plan. Um, we're pursuing a rezoning uh, to be hopefully finished by the end of this year to create 2,000 plus income-based homes that would be intergenerational, or that would be an affordable uh, home ownership component, and to create all of this housing uh, within, uh, to create a smaller community within the greater community that's integrated. Small blocks, uh, contextual buildings, um, and really just a, a, a community that creates opportunity and access. Michael, in other words, if you make low income today and you're in a one bedroom, there's room to grow within the community that when you're moderate or middle income and need a two bedroom, you have a, play, a new place to call home within East New York. And, and that's what we're finding to get great traction on. The, the difficulty of developing in a place like East New York, and I, I do think there's an opportunity there. We own, we developed and own uh, around 700 apartments in the neighborhood um, is that I think there are, you know, there's a large swath of, of middle income workforce people who live in East New York, but there's also a high concentration of NYCHA, which drags the sort of immediate community AMI down. Um, so average income down. And so it's difficult to get sort of mixed income developments financed in a neighborhood like East New York, because there aren't very many comparables. Most of the develop developed in East New York in recent years has been through one of the agencies uh, using a term sheet and, and tax exempt bonds. Do I think that it's possible to sort of creep AMIs up to sort of that middle income range and have demand? Yes. The difficulty is, is getting lenders comfortable. Now, one thing that the city has been, I think, doing a good job of, you know, over the last 10 years or so is allowing developers to utilize term sheets and build projects that are a majority sort of low and very low income, and then sprinkle some middle income units in those developments, um, which allows developers sort of in the second phase or the third phase to, to point to lenders and say, hey, look at this development we did, you know, five years ago, there were 10 units at 80% of AMI or 100% of AMI, and we rented those up. So now you have some comps. And so we can sort of creep that up and do a little bit more mixed income housing. We've done that in a couple of developments, um, but it's, it's incremental and it takes time. So it's, it's difficult just to say, okay, we have this huge new rezoning. We have this big site. We're going to build a building that's targeted towards middle income. Probably very difficult, if not impossible to get financed, but in 10 years, maybe. Andy, that's true. And in, in, we've been building at Nehemiah uh, Spring Creek with East Brooklyn congregations for over 20 years. Um, We've built about 700 single family homes, uh, for sale homes, and um, about uh, 600 rental apartments. And the for sale homes, you know, being sold at 100% AMI, 120% AMI, the real, there's real demand. Um, yeah. It's just a question of financing. As you go through our rental phases, which we're doing now, and we'll have about 700 more, uh, we're doing exactly what you said, which is um, using income averaging to put put in more 70 and 80 percent AMI units and some not sprinkling in 90 percent units to create uh, the the market so that lenders in our next few phases understand that. Um, and you know you've got to build to your question about safety, Michael. We're we're all building sort of entirely new neighborhoods out here, um, and people I think really feel that they live in a great neighborhood. Um, you've got eyes on the street. Uh, it feels safe. Uh, at least what we're building. And I think that's, that's Brian's goal as well. Yeah, I think ultimately the people behave and respect their, the environment that's produced around them. And the greater the environment we create as responsible developers, I think you'll see a precipitous drop in, in crime. The, the key is ultimately providing access to real amenities. And that starts with education. Let's talk about... Um... Coney Island. <clears throat> Frank spoke about the nice waterfront in Staten Island. Long Island City has a nice waterfront. Coney Island has a nice waterfront. But Coney Island also has a significant amount of NYCHA housing. So what do you see being, being done? I mean, Castamatitas has his market rate apartments at the end of Coney Island, right next to Seagate. Then you have Taconic and other people building all around. Are you guys involved with Coney Island? Or what do you see as the opportunities in on the island. Andy, Frank, and then Brian. You know, for me, I like Coney Island. I like going to Coney Island. I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity just from like a land perspective. It's just for me far from a commuting perspective. Now, now the commuting patterns have changed. 
and we have more work from home, that might change. Um, but you know, we we as a company generally, you know, develop our our sort of thesis and our, our business model is developing workforce housing on transit nodes within a reasonable commute to the city. And we just haven't Coney Island's a little at this point a little bit just sort of outside of our wheelhouse. So we we're not really actively looking at it. But yeah. Uh, Ryan, maybe I, I can't speak for Ryan, but uh, our, our, our construction, our sister company, our construction company has entertained projects out there, but we haven't done much. Um, I think there's a lot of privately owned land that is slowly getting built, as you mentioned. And I think, you know, it just, it's going to take a while, um, but projects are under construction and perhaps, you know, maybe when, when Andy and I see those projects succeed, we'll get out there. But um, I mean, the city's big. We, we were in a lot of places. Uh, it's Coney Island has not been one of them. Right. I, I just think you need extremely long-term patient capital to develop a hundred percent type market rate development uh, in Coney Island. But I think the prospects will be improved given uh, the, the post COVID world of flexibility to work remote, just like the waterfront uh, developments in Williamsburg, Greenpoint, Long Island city did very well uh, during the pandemic. I think that shift will also help oceanfront property. I think time will tell, but it'll, it would require very patient capital. Crystal Apple, the guys say it's getting better and it looks pretty good out there. If we build enough affordable housing, hopefully people will stay in the city. And as long as we have good developers, like the three people here today, we know that new developments will take place. I'd like to thank Andy, Frank, and our producer, Brian, and I'll see you next week. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you.